Okay, so um, yeah, the theme of this workshop is improving speleothem oxygen isotope interpretation through analysis of modern observations and models. And um, this is a very large topic we were given or asked to talk about. So I, I, I've taken um, a bit of time to go through uh, the lecture, the great lecture that Matt Lackney uh, gave, uh, I think a couple of weeks ago. And I'm going to kind of go a bit further in depth and provide some more details about some of the recommendations that he, he made. And um, yeah, we'll see how this goes. Okay, so just as a review, um, the main controls on speleothem oxygen, oxygen isotope composition are shown in this nice cartoon from Matt's uh, 2009 review paper. And you can see there's a lot of complex processes on here, which were which he went into in more detail um, in his lecture. But effectively, what we um, can, can say is that the delta 18 of speleothems in any given cave are representing an integrated signal of a large number of atmospheric processes, including you know, evaporation conditions, um, transport, rain out, um, or rally distillation, and um, changes potentially in moisture source region, et cetera, um, as well as more local processes related to any fractionation effects that might occur in the soil zone or epicars. And then finally, we have in-cave processes, which also affect whether the speleothem calcite is actually forming in isotopic equilibrium. And so, so in order to unravel a speleothem delta 18 record, we need to consider all of these different factors. Um, so here's a more simple cartoon, kind of breaking them down into those three areas. The climate system, has a major impact on the delta 18 of rainfall that's falling at any given location. And we know that the delta 18 of rainfall in most regions is what drives the largest component of speleothem delta 18 variability. Um, however, uh, that signal can undergo further modification through soil and epicars processes that were mentioned last time, things like evaporation in the soil, um, preferential infiltration, or I think what not termed effective, isotopically effective um, recharge or that makes the whatever water actually makes it into the cave, um, as well as whatever mixing occurs in the epicarst region. And then of course, within the cave, you can have things like evaporation, uh, rapid CO2 degassing, et cetera, that can lead to, to um, speleothem delta 18 falling out of, out of equilibrium. And in fact, most speleothems aren't perfectly in equilibrium, as I'll mention later. Okay, so if we, what, what I hope to do with this lecture is, for those of you who might be working on speleothem paleoclimate records from a cave, maybe it's a cave that has been extensively studied already, or maybe it's a cave that you're, is brand new and you're trying to figure out um, how to interpret records from that site. Hopefully there'll be something for everybody in here. And I also understand that there are limitations with how often you can do things like cave monitoring work or replication might be challenging. So um, I'll try and address um, some strategies there, but, but I guess what I'm gonna present is like an ideal view of what everybody should do for the cave that they're working in. But I understand that there are some reasons why that might not be possible. So there might be ways that you can use existing data or data from nearby sites or models to help improve your interpretation in those cases. Okay, so based on those three main, um, main factors that can influence the speleothem record at your site, there I've put these key research questions to ask. And these are research questions that I think anybody who's working on a speleothem, speleothem oxygen isotope record could um, and ask about their specific study site. So what are the climatic controls on the oxygen isotopic composition of precipitation at your site? And to answer this, you need data um, for the precipitation isotope composition. And so I'll talk through some different ways and sources of that data. Um, the second question is how do soil and epicarous processes affect the delta 18 of cave drip water? 
for that, you also ideally need some monitoring data. Um, there's also uh, proxy system modeling that can be um, helpful for this. Uh, the third question is, is, does the modern Scalia FemCal site reliably reflect cave drip water Delta 018? Um, and so to do that, again, you need some monitoring data ideally um, in order to test that. Um, and then the fourth question finally is, okay, so now that you have these first three, some idea about these first three questions, the final question, of course, is what is the most robust interpretation of your Spilithum Delta 018 record? And so that is a, um, something that has many different components and is very dependent upon things like the time scale that you're interested in, the region that you're working in, um, the resolution of your record, and the quality of the age model, and et cetera. So I'm going to start by delving into this first question here about the precipitation controls. And I'm going to spend a fair bit of the time today on that question. OK, so um, <clears throat> there are a number of different ways to obtain precipitation isotope data for your site. One of the, one of the um, best ways, ideally, is to sample it yourself or through a collaborator. Um, so especially in a place, if you're in a region where there's not a lot of other data sources. So the best way is to get data from close to your study site. And to do that, um, often, depending on where you are, maybe you are really close to your cave site and you can do it yourself, which is great. But if you are not and you're working in remote regions, uh, like we are, we're working in Southeast Asia and in Mexico, um, where we can't get there very much, especially the last couple of years due to COVID. <laughs> So um, we are very lucky to have built some strong relationships with local collaborators. Um, so here's a picture of uh, Gabby Serrato Marks, who finished her PhD a couple of years ago and was collaborating with us on this project, um, training our, collab our local collaborator, Cheva Brones Benitez, on precipitation sampling methods. And you can see this little contraption here. And this is a, uh, shown here is that, um, schematic of this evaporation limiting rainfall collector that we we use. And the design for this was actually shared with me to me uh, by a friend uh, and colleague, uh, Dr. Crystal Tully Cordova, shown here, who studied water isotopes on the Navajo Nation for her PhD, which she did at University of Utah with Gabe Bowen. And she's now the chief, hydrolo chief hydrologist for Navajo Nation. But because the Navajo Nation is like a really remote region, she had to build these collectors that could be left for a month or so um, in a relatively hot and arid condition sometimes. And these have shown to hold up quite well to that. So we could sh share the, some of this, but it's pretty much parts you can get at a hardware store for the most part. So that's what we use. There are many other, um, um, ways you can collect data as well through event-based sampling and or through a lar using a larger reservoir that totals the precipitation in places that, where you get a lot more rainfall. So our collaborator collects the samples basically every time after there's a rainfall event um, or when the bottle gets close to being full so that we try and capture all of the rainfall. So, <clears throat> and then of course you can combine, um, if you set up a precipitation sampling, um, system, then you can combine that also with other data like weather station data, rain gauge data, or, or precipitation logger like Pluvamate. Um, and one bonus of this is that this can be a good collaboration um, with local community members um, like Cheva, who lives just really at the base of the Karst Hill where, our, where one of our cave sites is in Mexico. Um, just a quick aside is that and that it can be really challenging to, and take time to build up these relationships. And you want to make sure that it's being done in a ethical and respectful manner. Um, so there may be collaborators that would like to have the data. So I think sharing data with them is good practice if they are interested in that. Um, paying them is also a very good practice. So you can budget that into proposals um, and or include them as co-authors if that would be a value to them. 
Of course, the downside of this is that it's time consuming, expensive, and logistically challenging and hard to maintain for a really long time period. So this isn't necessarily practical if you are doing a you know, PhD for, for three to five years. <clears throat> okay, so another source of data that you've probably all heard of is the Global Network for Isotopes and Precipitation. Um, GNIP is a worldwide monitoring um, network where they are measuring Delta O18, Delta D, and tritium in monthly precipitation samples around at sites around the world. And they've been doing this since 1960. Um, the program was initially established actually to monitor tritium in rainfall in order to monitor nuclear weapons testing uh, because tritium is produced um, during, during nuclear explosions. And so um, you can see a map here showing the network of stations and, and how there are some regions which have much more dense coverage than others, like Europe and Western parts of Western North America. Whereas places like Southeast Asia and Mexico, where I'm working, are, are pretty, pretty sparse. Um, just as an aside, GNIP has been a hugely important um, program in the development of paleoclimatology. So these two fundamental papers, which paved the way for, for example, for ice core um, records, but also for spelio a lot of what we do in speleothems, um, Dansgaard 1964 and Craig 1961 are two papers that are classic um, things that I think every student who's working on, on this type of research should read. Um, so I put those there. And I also wanted to, um, let's see, I'm gonna just escape out of this for a second. So I was just going to do a quick tour of the way to access the data. So the data is housed by the IA, in the IAEA website, um, and it's free to access, but you do need to create an account. Um, so I've already logged into my account here. I think Annabelle maybe put the, some of the links in the chat. Um, so the system is called Wazer, Wiser, the Water Isotope System for Data Analysis, Visualization and Retrieval. So if you get to this page after you've created an account, then you can click here on data sets. And I'm just going to go with the default options here, but you can select different things here. And then I'm going to go ahead and just select a location. So um, if you click on that, it will open up a map. And I'm gonna zoom in. A lot of what I'm gonna do today, I'm gonna use some examples from our work in Mexico at, our, at Cueva Bonita, which is work that was um, the focus of one of my recent PhD students, uh, Kevin Wright's uh, dissertation. So Kevin very kindly provided a lot of these figures that I'm gonna show later on today. But our cave site is located in Tamaulipas here. Um, and as you can see, there's only, so the green, um, our river data. They also have an isotope in rivers database, and you can actually filter that um, up here if I wanted to. So I just want sites that have GNIP monthly data. And you can see there's only two sites here um, in Chihuahua and Veracruz. And so I'm going to go ahead and you can use this little thing here to draw a box. You can include multiple sites if you want, but I'm just going to do it for this one. Hit OK. And then it tells me that um, Veracruz has data from 1962 to 1988 and this many measurements. And I'm going to go ahead and hit View. OK, and then over here on the left, it gives you some, it automatically will give you some statistics and plots. So here it plots Delta D versus Delta O18. Um, along with the global meteoric water line. Um, so you can compare that. And then um, if you want to look at the statistics, it tells you the monthly means um, based on the number, the number of samples for Delta 18, et cetera, as well as the DXS. And it also gives you some climatic information, um, air temperature and pressure and precipitation. Here we have, um, it also will do annual means um the long term mean um and note that it has this 
weighted mean and average mean. This is the amount weighted precipitation uh, mean, and this is just the regular average. And it's really important if you are using GNIP data where you, for example, have monthly means like this, it's extremely important that you, if you wanna determine the average delta 18 of rain that's falling at your site, you need to create a weighted average by weighting it by a precipitation amount. Um, so it's a, it's a simple calculation um, to do that, but you can see that there would be quite a big difference um, in some cases if you just took the, the, the raw average. Okay. Um, it also will give you the statistics for the local meteoric water line based on that data. Um, and then you can click here on information and export and you can download the file in a number of formats. I've been having trouble getting it to download it as Excel. Um, so I've been downloading it. It, it. it only seems to want to do XML files, which if you're, used to working with those, that's fine. But I downloaded a, a CSV and then opened up in Excel. And so um, let's see if I can. <laughs> Sorry, should have had this open before. Um, so I, I saved the file yesterday from Veracruz. So it will look something like this and it will just have, it will have, um, you know, all of a bunch of information about the samples, including where it was measured, et cetera. And then it will, will give you. And one thing you can see right away is that, and this is a real big problem with GNIP in general, is that there's often a lot of data gaps. Um, so some sites, because this is a lot, such a large global network, it's run in cooperation with partners around the world. Um, it, there are some regions and sites that only have a few years of data, some and a few, some that have really long time series. So um, it's up to you to kind of see what's available near your study site and 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 use that data for what with um, as much as you can. Okay, so let's see. Oops, let's get rid of that. So let me go back to my PowerPoint. Okay. So there is a second um, database that includes, actually includes the GNIP data, but also includes lots of other data, um, including, as you can see here, ocean water data. Um, so this is the water isotope database on waterisotopes.org. This is a website that's led by uh, Gabe Bowen's research group at the University of Utah. And this has been around for, hmm, I don't know, maybe five years or so now. Um, and this is something that anybody can contribute data to as well. So I think that that would be a great thing for a lot of us to do. I actually have a lot of water isotope data I've been meaning to submit to them, but I haven't yet. Um, but any case, in any case, um, okay. I'm sorry yes? to interrupt, but you stopped sharing, I think. We can't oh. see your slides anymore. Oh, no, sorry. Thank you for interrupting. I'm not sure how that happened. Okay. You can see the, the GNIP website, right? In yes, the Excel? now we can see. Okay. Yep. Okay. Okay. Sorry about that. Yeah, so so the water isotope database, um, this is showing the number of, of data points at any site. And um, if I'll just go ahead and click on on here. So on waterisotopes.org, you can um, see how to contribute data. There's an app you can use as well. Um, and if you want to actually look at the database itself, oh, my computer's being slow now. Oh, there we go. Okay. So if you want to look at the, the database itself, you could zoom in. So like I'm going to zoom back into Mexico over here. And you, now you can see that there's in addition to the two GNIP stations, there's actually a lot of um, data points. A lot of these, what you'll see, like say I wanna zoom in to close to my study site up here. So we're working in this biosphere reserve, El Cielo. Um, it'll pop up and it'll tell you like, basically this is just one sample somebody collected. 
Um, there's many different sample types. Apparently even beer is a sample type that is in this database, in case you're curious, but there's lots of things. And so the ground sample, I think is just like groundwater. Yeah. Um, and then you can usually click a link to download the data. So, so it would take a bit more work to potentially identify, but there may be useful things in there. So I wanted to share that as well. Also encourage people to upload their data um, to make that a more useful tool. And there's like specific policies for data usage and things that you can read if you either wanna use the data or submit data. Okay. <clears throat> Um, also available on waterisotopes.org um, is a link to, actually, I'll go ahead and get this. Oops. Okay, so um, there's this isoscapes link here, which is actually hosted on Purdue website. And this is a tool um, oh, no, that's not the one, sorry. I'll just go back to this one. Okay, so there's ISOMAP. Um, Matt mentioned isoscapes in his lecture, which is if you want to get a sense of the, the spatial variability in, in isotopes in your study region, you can create an isoscape. For those of you who um, want an easy way to do that, ISOMAP is a tool that um, is available. It's a GIS-based web tool where you can build different maps for different regions. Um, I'm not going to go through that in detail, but I just wanted to let you know that that exists. Um, and then finally, another tool that was mentioned in Matt's lecture is the Online Isotopes and Precipitation Calculator, um, which is also hosted on the same website. And, and this is, again, a um, it's, a, it's basically modeled data that's effectively an interpolation of GNIF data. And this was um, presented in three different papers by, by Gabe Bowen and co-authors that are listed on the PowerPoint slide. But effectively, all you do is enter in your, um, enter in, oops, enter in your lat long and elevation. So this is the, data for Irvine. So um, you can ask it to do monthly values. And it will give you, you can have it do confidence in intervals as well. So it gives you uh, uncertainty on those as well. Um, so that's another great way to quickly get a sense for what's the seasonal cycle at your site, um, what's the mean value. Um, you could take um, climate data from your region and calculate the weighted means. So again, these are not weighted. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So just a note on the OIPC, it's a really useful tool and very easy to get quick data, but just be aware that you should use it with caution because it is based on interpolation of this GNIP data. So in regions with complex topography, with very sparse GNIP coverage, it's going to likely have higher uncertainty. So um, it's best to verify it with observations from your site if you can. Okay, and then the third source of, um, of Delta 18 data for precipitation comes from models. So as you probably know, water isotopes are incorporated as tracers in several GCMs now, and they act as a tracer of the water cycle, undergoing fractionation processes through condensation and evaporation, et cetera. Um, and so these can be very useful tools when we're interpreting paleoclimate data, as I'll show later. But also there are modern simulations that simulate historical Delta 18 using um, reanalysis data. So I can't explain exactly how this works, but they use a spectral nudging technique. It's something like a type of data assimilation um, where they constrain the circulation in the model by actual reanalysis wind fields. Um, and so that means that for the time periods of the reanalysis, um, so from 1979 to present, or from the 20th, there's the 20th century reanalysis as well. So there's different 
different models have used different um, reanalysis uh, data. Okay, so um, ISO-GSM um, was developed by Kei Yoshimura, and this has been the most widely utilized model within um, paleoclimate because it's undergone, I think, the most extensive validation in comparison with modern observations. So you can access it here. I would also recommend if you want to use it um, and you have any issues with, I would recommend emailing Kay and you can find his contact information in here somewhere because he's been really, really helpful at providing data and so on. So, so ISO GSM, here's a comparison um, of um, GNIP data with um, the ISO-GSM simulated data. And it does a pretty good job of capturing the mean values and the variability um, in the seasonal cycle in different regions. So this is a great tool where there's just, if you have you know, no long time series and you're interested in understanding the dynamical controls on the precipitation isotopes at your site, it can be useful. Um, that said, the Delta-18 that it simulates is very unlikely to be compare well with reality. It is a model. And so, and, re and it's subject to all of the uncertainties with reanalysis data, which you know that precipitation and reanalyses re can be really problematic. So while it can be useful to understand the dynamics and the controls again, it's not necessarily useful to sort of tell you or compare directly, for example, with the speleothem record. Um, in addition to ISO-GSM, there's a number of other nudge simulations um, that were part of a stable water isotope intercomparison project called SWING, and this is SWING 2. Um, and so you can see more details about that here um, if you want, and some of, and you can also use some of these other models if you wanted. So let's see, oops. <clears throat> okay. All right. So now that you have isotope data for precipitation in your site, whether that's from yourself sampling it or from databases or models, uh, the next steps are to conduct some basic exploratory data analysis. And this is the fun part where you can compare your data sets with a large number of different um, time series. Um, so some of the basic things are, are shown here that you could do, like um, you want to determine the amount weighted annual mean for your site, compare that with your drip water. That's a very simple step. <laughs> um, <clears throat> you want to know the seasonal cycle in your, in your um, region. So here's a, this is actually data for our site in Northeast Mexico showing the precipitation and temperature seasonality. This is showing the Veracruz GNIP data, uh, which is quite a, ways away from our site, as well as ISO-GSM data for the grid cell that um, contains our site, showing that the seasonal cycle is captured relatively well. There's a bit of an offset, which could be real or, or it could be due to the different location, or it could be just some sort of bias. Um, here, we've conducted a spatial correlation where we took the ISO-GSM time series um, and correlated it with precipitation time series and found that the delta 18 at our site in the model is reflective of precipitation amount across this sort of region here in Northeast Mexico. Um, here we have, and then you can also do uh, test relationships with temperature, precipitation amount, et cetera. Um, and here's a number of different correlations. Here's the meteoric water line. This is the uh, uh, comparison of rainfall values. This is from actual samples that we collected at Quivipanita from Cheva, um, showing the influence of the amount effect at the site and so on. Okay, so I'm gonna have to start speeding up here, I realize, because I'm far behind. And then um, you can also um, do things like, look at the influence of moisture source trajectories on the isotope signal at your site in the modern. Um, so our study site here is sitting in between regions. Uh, this, these are other Kate records and how they've been interpreted. 
all of these more tropical sites are have been interpreted and published um, as basically records of precipitation amounts, whereas these sites up here have been interpreted as dominated by changes in moisture source region um, because some of these sites get winter precipitation from the Pacific and then summer precipitation from the Gulf of Mexico and so or from the monsoon. Um, and so, <clears throat> so we wanted to check, okay, well, our site is here. What, what is the dominant control here? And, and we already saw that some evidence from the last slide that it's reflecting the amount effect um, effectively or regional amount effect. Um, and, but we also wanted to rule out moisture source trajectories. So we conducted back trajectories where you can basically run the model and trace the, the history of the air masses that deliver rainfall to your site. Um, and so here's a, here's a um, number of trajectories that were done for the winter as well as for the summer and what we can see. And then the moisture flux is um, color coded down here. And so you can see that the vast majority of the rain bearing trajectories are coming to our site from the Gulf of Mexico and the tropical Atlantic. So we're assuming that winter precipitation has a really minor impact on the isotope signal and that very little actually is received at the site. So this is the type of thing that the second part of our workshop today will, will get you started on being able to produce for your location. Um, okay, um, let's see here. I'm gonna go ahead and skip through this little uh, second case study. Effectively, um, I, I shared a recommended paper from Hanging Yang, who was a former PhD student in my group, uh, where we use ISO-GSM model to do several um, analyses for not only our study site in Northern Laos, but also several other cave sites in order to identify the dominant climatic controls on interannual scale Delta 18 variability. Um, so here are some of our validation data showing that it captures, roughly captures the, the mean um, seasonal cycle. Um, this is the ISO-GSM and this is the GNIP comparison. Um, and then this is the precipitation amount here. Um, and effectively what we did, and this is something that I think is a good approach to do with modern and paleo models potentially, is to do a spatial correlation. So that's where we're taking the time series of the model data from our site, in this case, Laos, and conducting a spatial correlation and creating these maps where this is showing the R values. So we can see the correlation between Delta 18 and SSTs, between um, uh, wind, uh, vertical wind shear. Um, and then we conducted composite of composites of years that were identified as strong El Nino um, events, um, et cetera. And so this basically led us to infer that the Delta 18 at our site here is strongly dominate, interannual variability strongly dominated by ENSO. And we linked that to changes in, by comparison with a number of different climate parameters, we linked it to changes in moisture source region um, with more proximal moisture source region coming to our site um, in, in El Nino years with a heavier isotope composition. So you can read the paper to learn more about that if you want. Okay, so moving on to the next question, how do soil and upper karst processes affect the Delta 18 of cave drip water? Um, this is a complicated question <laughs> and there's a lot of different approaches that could be used to look at this. So I'm just going to summarize a couple of kind of basic key ones. Uh, cave monitoring and models or like proxy system models, hydrologic or geochemical models can all be used to help constrain this. Um, here's a photo of Kevin um, sampling some drip water in Cueva Bonita. Um, and with drip water sampling, I, it's good practice to sample it for a number of different parameters, but I'm focusing just on oxygen isotopes here. And the question is, does Delta 18 reflect the amount weighted annual mean of precipitation or is there a seasonal bias? Um, ideally, you want to sample monthly or seasonally, if possible, to constrain variability. I know this 
for our speaking for our own sites is, is, is often a challenge because it's hard to get there um, that frequently or certain times of year are unsafe because of the monsoons. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Sample multiple drips within the cave to identify how much variability there is within the cave. That might also give you some idea. And then plot your data on the meteoric water line to identify evidence for evaporation, um, which would pull it off the line as shown in, in Matt's lecture. OK, um, a second approach is hydrologic modeling. Um, so you probably may have heard of KARST-4, which is the KARST hydrology model um, developed, developed by, by Bradley and Baker and others. And this model is um, basically takes, takes climate, your inputs are climate data like temperature, precipitation, evapotranspiration, um, and delta 18, and then you can have the water transported to the cave through a number of different fluxes with different of different sizes and they can be stored in different stores there can be an overflow etc so i would recommend looking at some of these papers to learn more about the model um, just to show an example of what this can be potentially useful for is here we have we use some inputs from we use inputs from isogsm delta 18 precipitation temperature and evaporation plotted here these were the inputs that we use and then you can basically develop these pseudo cell pseudo proxy stalagmite time series um and so again this was using the 20th century reanalysis data and here we have four different stalagmites that records that could, in theory, be formed in the same cave um, just due to differences in hydrology. So the offset between them is purely driven by what's going on in the epicarsts. And the, the, the range here is about 1.2 per mil. So this, and this is pretty consistent with some of the published studies um, from that group. And this was, this is not published. This is from Hunging's thesis. Um, it's only in there. But basically, it highlights that you need to be careful about interpreting these smaller variations um, without additional proxy evidence or without replication, because some of them could be purely driven by hydrology. Um, and then there's many other approach that we, approaches that we don't have time to discuss here. So moving on to the third question, does modern Spilithum calcite reliably reflect cave drip water, delta 18? For this, um, there's a cave monitoring approach um, can be used. So if you are able to collect drip water and modern calcite on glass plates, like the one shown here, um, you can, and also monitor temperature in the cave, you can determine um, whether, whether the calcite is forming an isotopic equilibrium. You can either take the drip water and calcite delta 18 data and use a, one of the calibrations available to calculate temperature and then compare it with your measured cave temperatures, or you can take the temperature in the drip water and calculate what the calcite should be and compare it with their observations. So however you want to do that. But really, I wanted to emphasize that the results will vary first, depending on which calibration you're using. So a lot of people might have been using Kim and O'Neill, for example, um, which would give you a value up to one or one and a half per mil different than um, this this is the De recent calibration presented by De Aaron et al, but not recommended in his lecture. So, and, and also because of this, we, we know now that speleothems are rarely forming in perfect isotopic equilibrium. The question is about whether they're very, cl how close are they? So the best test is replication of different records. Um, but if that's not possible, or in addition to that, this is also something you can do. And be careful when you're using these, um, these, these equations to make sure you're keeping your, um, your uh, delta 18 values in the right, with reference to the right standard. So in, when you see an equation in this form, the fractionation 10 to the third natural log alpha, which will be the difference in delta 18 between the calcite and the 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 water, um, you need to make sure that 
the deltoid teen values are in the same same standard units. So both in in SMO or PBB. <clears throat> Okay, another um, approach for, for this is, again, using proxy system models. Uh, there's a couple of ones I just want to make sure people are aware of. So there's Cave Calc, um, which is a Freaksy based forward model for speleothem and drip water chemistry that can calculate delta 18, as well as other proxies like trace elements and so on, uh, and carbon isotopes. So there's, and that can be found there. I'm not going to say anything more about that. Um, the KARS solution model um, is actually a combination of the KARS-4 hydrology model and I solution, which is a, a model for in-cave um, uh, processes. And so this is sh showing the conceptual model where it's linking the hydrology with processes in the cave and, and things that can affect the delta 18 of the um, calcite in the cave, things like the drip PCO2, uh, cave PCO2, humidity, ventilation, drip interval. And so this evaluates the potential impact of bo both of these things on speleothem delta 18. And it does require some cave monitoring data um, in order to, to constrain it. So the I won't say too much more about this. Um, the uh, files and, and user guide can be found at these links here. And then there's a preprint about the model um, that is posted here that Pauline Treble is leading. Um, we have used this a little bit. Um, this is showing some basic results of what you might be able to do um, using some monitoring data for CO2 temperature and humidity we have. Um, this is looking at the potential impact of variations in drip interval, relative humidity, um, and PCO2 on the delta 18 signal in our cave. And you can see the, if you look at the units on the vertical axes, it's a pretty small amount of variability, um, which is good news for us. <laughs> um, so that's what some of that might look like. Okay, and then finally moving on to the last um, question. The most robust interpretation of your speleothem delta 18 record. It's a complicated question, and it's the reviewers might may or may not agree with you, um, but that's part of the process. So, so really, this is a huge topic, and that's like what probably if you're doing a PhD, the majority of your time will be spent thinking about and working on. Um, so, the speleothem data that we get. Will likely reflect a combination is going to reflect a combination of factors from large scale climate dynamics to through to local variations. Um, and so the interpretation may seem challenging. Um, here we have a our record, one of our records from Cueva Benita in Mexico, um, showing just I'll just focus on the delta 18 here, um, showing some clear positive excursions during Heinrich events, a clear um, shift to more negative values during, during um, the deglaciation and so on. And this is, I should note, all of this data is under re revision right now, um, um, hopefully to be resubmitted in the very near future. Um, but just in general, some tips, and I'm sure you know most of these already, but reading the literature is extremely important. Um, so read the literature extensively to know what's already been done, uh, what the outstanding questions are for the region that you're working in, in terms of the climate system, um, and to know what models are out there and might be useful for your work. Um, develop some hypotheses about your data, and you can, I feel like speleothem research is often a bit more exploratory um than hypothesis driven in the beginning and that's in part because of the nature of what we're doing because often we don't necessarily know what age our samples are going to be or how good the age model is going to be or you know what yeah it's it's hard to come up with a hypothesis when you don't even know the the age of your sample and it's hard, very hard to target a sample of a certain age <laughs> um so it takes some luck so, so it's okay to start with some exploratory uh, approach, but do de develop some hypotheses about the climate system that can be tested 
as you go. Um, use what you've learned about the modern system from all of that previous um, work that I talked about as a framework for interpreting the record. Although, obviously, some of these things may have been different in the past, and that's part of why we're doing this. So consider the potential impact of changes in temperature, um, precipitation amounts, ice volume, seasonality, atmospheric ocean dynamics. And the specifics are really going to depend on the time scale of interest, as well as the region you're working in. Um, compare your data with other relevant records, obviously. And then finally, I want to plug, put in a plug to collaborate with climate modelers. It's great if you learn how to process and work with climate model output yourself um, and do basic di diagnostics, but it's really, really important, I think, to get the best and most useful data that's actually going to help us with improving uh, climate projections, which is the whole point, I think, of a lot of this work is to to work closely with people who who really have a strong um, understanding of climate dynamics and of the models and their strengths and limitations. So um, yes, and then finally, um, my main one of my most important things to say is that I also think oxygen isotopes are not enough, and that you should we should be looking at other proxies more, including carbon isotopes, which can be complicated, but um, can also, in some cases, especially if you can replicate them and do perhaps constrain the, the controls with some monitoring where it can be extremely useful. But trace elements, um, new, new, new emerging proxies like clumped isotopes or calcium isotopes, all of these things, so um, can make for a much more robust and rich paleoclimate record. Um, <clears throat> just this is an example of a of um, the impact of doing ice volume correction on a record. So Matt mentioned that the delta 18 of seawater varies by about 1.2 per mil between, between glacial maxima and glacial minima. Um, so that can be a significant, um, if we assume that that shift in the source water composition is translated directly to the speed of the thumb, which does have some caveats that um, can, can lead your um, values to be off by about 1.2 per mil. So here we have um, some raw data in black and corrected data in blue showing how big of an impact that could potentially have. So that's something that not everybody, it isn't common practice. I'd say some people do it and some people don't. So it depends on, just be aware of, of the impact that will have if you're working on glacial interglacial timescales. And then here is a example of some um, climate model analyses that we've conducted um, in collaboration with uh, Clay Tabor and Tripti Bhattacharya. And this is using the IC ICESM model, which is isotope enabled version of CESM. And this is a hosing experiment to simulate a Heinrich event. And so we can identify, we're trying to pinpoint the dynamical mechanisms that are causing drying at our site during Heinrich events and arguing that it is driven in largely by cool SSTs and a strengthening of easterlies, um, which diverts moisture away from our, causes more divergence over our study site. So hopefully you'll see that out soon. <laughs> okay, so I did go a bit long, but I think we still have time um, for for the next part, which is um, using a more practical guide to using high split, pi split. Um, this is an example of a figure from um, Annabelle's paper from 2020 showing the uh, regions of moisture uptake for rainfall that is falling near our uh, study site in central Vietnam and um, showing this big shift in moisture source region between the um, summer and the winter. Um, and so that's the type of thing that can be extremely useful um, for understanding the modern system as well as interpreting the paleo record. Okay, so I realized I didn't specifically put in time for questions, but maybe we wanna wait till the end. Um, or if you, if people have questions, I can also answer them in the chat. So why don't I hand it back over to Annabelle? 
Okay. Um, yeah, so just gonna see share my screen. Um, okay, so um, let me know if I need to slow down with with something or if you can't see something, just let me know. Um, okay, so today I'm gonna talk a little bit about the basics of using the high split um, desktop GUI and also the Python based application. Um, and this is gonna be hands on, so I'm not gonna talk about um, the physics of the models. I'm just gonna show you how we can use the model. Um, and just I actually remember just a quick question. Did anyone get to download the data files? Because I know they're quite big. Yeah. Okay. Then let's start. Um, so if you all just double click on the GUI um, and open high split in itself. Um, okay. So if you click on menu, um, okay. So this actually opens the panel where you can use high split. And to use high split, or to set up a model run here, you click on trajectory, then on uh, set up run. And I'm just gonna clear this. Okay, so what we need to run the model is a date and time. We need a location where we want to run our model um, and we need meteorological data that we want to feed the model with. So in our case, um, this is the files that I uh, uploaded on the drive. So if you could navigate in your files. Um, oh yeah, also I wanted to say, so I'm on Windows 10. So if anyone is like on a Mac or something else, um, please let me know if you have any difficulties um, and we will try and get that sorted as well. Okay, so um, navigating to the high split folder. So if you just accepted the default installation. Um, so for me, it's on my C drive and it's just called high split. Um, and you will find all the different subfolders. And I've created this folder. So um, just go ahead and create a folder with a similar name. And then you can just copy and paste the files in here. And basically these files are um, meteorological data from August, 2016. And this is week one to five. Okay, so the other important folder that we use in while using high split is the working folder. Um, so I will probably have some more files in here. Uh, if you've never run the model, this will be a bit more empty. Okay, so we can go ahead and add the meteorological data by, so first of all, you should clear if there's anything in here left and then add meteorological files. This should open. Um, Usually the default is into your working, high split working directory. So just navigate back and find the folder you created and highlight and select all of the files. And then they should appear in this format and it should be listed as five files. Okay. Um, okay, so the next thing we want to do is decide on a time where we want to run our metal model backwards. So the way high split works is it's creating a backwards trajectory. So you can trace um, an air passer along a certain trajectory. And in this case, you can also choose up to three different heights, for example, or three different starting locations when using this, this uh, desktop based GUI. Okay. So go ahead. I think in most cases, if you have not used the model, it should all display zeros. Um, so what we want to do is put in the year 2016 and August, and then we're just going to select the random date, which is just August 12th in this case, and we set the time to midnight. Um, this is just for the purpose of this um, tutorial. And then the next thing we're going to do is set up the starting locations. So, and this is actually set to Irvine, but because we talked about Mexico before, we could just type in the coordinates for Cueva Bonita. Um, and in this case, we have three locations because we're looking at three different heights. So this is like 10, 500 meters and a thousand meters um, above mean sea level. So we can copy and paste these in. And once that all done, we click okay. 
Okay, so the next thing is to decide how long you want to run your model back in time. So the direction um, to select is backwards and let's just run the model for 120 hours. The rest can be left by to the default setting. So this is just telling the GUI to use um, the data we provided. And this tells it to export the simulation data in a file called dump. Okay, and then we go ahead and save. Okay, so did that work for everyone so far? Okay. <laughs> um, good. So the next thing we can do is actually run the model. So you go back to trajectory, select run model, um, and then run using setup file. And this little window should pop up for you. Um, once it says, complete high split, you just exit. Um, and now if you go back to your high split working directory, um, there should be, yeah. So it created our tdump file, which is now containing the information we need to plot our data. So here, if you go back to trajectory display and select trajectory, uh, you will see, okay, we're gonna read the file tdump to use it, to plot it. And the rest can just be left to the default setting and you say execute. And this is what you should end up with. So this is the little stars marking our uh, coordinates. And these three are the different trajectories depending on height. Okay, so I hope this worked for everyone. Uh, let me know if there are any problems or if I should slow down. Okay, so this was basically just a very simple um, example how we can use Hasbro to plot trajectories. And what we want to do now is, oh, maybe I can show you some of the, um, the problems we run into with using the GUI. So for example, here, where it says a selected files is five, actually the GUI is limited to 12 files, so you can't uh, upload more data. Um, and you also struggle to run this over a longer time period. So if you want to run the simulations over several years, several months, um, that is where you want to use the PySplit. And that's what we're going to do next. But before that, um, I just wanted to show you. So if you open the note, I think it's called Notepad or Editor. Um, so you just have a look at the tdump file here. So it usually gives you lots of information. So if you have not run the model before, the only thing it's going to export here is going to be pressure. And if you want to access all the different um, parameters that it can also uh, export as part of the run, uh, you need to actually let the GUI know about this. So if you go to advanced configuration setup trajectory, then this little menu is going to pop up and you can select number six at meteorological output along the trajectory. And you want to tick all of them. Once you're done um, selecting them, so for us especially, it's going to be the humidity that we need to export, but I usually just export all of them so you have them in case you need them. Then you click save and save again. Um, okay. Okay, so then we can go ahead and open Anaconda Navigator, which usually takes some time. Okay, uh, once you open Anaconda, you can click onto environments 
and go to the PySplit environment. So I've called this PySplit, but I think for most it will be PySplit in. Um, so just go ahead and activate it. Okay, so once it's activated, it's gonna display this button here. Um, and then you can go back to home and launch Spider. So I like to use Spider, but if you like to use anything else, you can also do that. Uh, you're not limited here. Um, yeah, I just like to use it. Okay. Um, okay, so if you were able to download the um, two files that were like .py, uh, um, you should be able to open them. So once you have opened Spider, you can click on open, oh, sorry. And then just go ahead and select the files you've downloaded. Um, so in this case, like that one, and you just click open and it will open the files. Um, And then I've also put in some comments um, for more information. If you want to see more tutorials on how to use the high speed GUI, um, there's lots of tutorials, also including videos on the NOAA website uh, that are really, really useful because the high speed GUI can do a lot more than just backwards trajectories or forward trajectories. It can also track and simulate gas or particle movements. Um, so yeah, if you want to explore more, um, you can go ahead and do that. But for paleo climate, I feel like doing backwards trajectory uh, simulations is the most commonly used, um, or for what we most commonly use, high split. Um, and for more information on pi split, I would suggest you go and um, check out the GitHub from Melissa Cross, um, who developed pi split. She also wrote a couple of papers about it um, that I recommend to check out. So, okay. So the first thing we want to do, if we have all opened our script. Um, so yeah, just as an overview, I don't know how many people are familiar with Python at all or have used um, Anaconda or um, Spider at all. So uh, usually you just start with importing all the packages you need um, to do your analysis. So in this case, it's gonna be, we're gonna import PySplit. Um, and you can do that by in, so this is my script and this is the console. Um, and here we will be able to see like variables and plots later on. So the first thing we can do is highlight um, this section and on Windows, you can press F9. Um, so it just runs the selected path here. I think for Mac, you can go right click and use um, run selection. Um, so that should also work. Okay. Um, yeah, and then the first thing we want to do, so if you remember what we just did in high school, yeah, sure. Sorry, yeah, okay. I may have missed this entirely. Did you share the link to the code, the script? Oh, it should be, yeah, it should be in on the Google Drive. Oh, I didn't click that link, okay. Sorry. Oh, sorry, no, it's okay. I, I still had it from the other day. <laughs> okay, yeah, <laughs> sure, um, yeah. Okay, so that is basically repeating what we've just done in the GUI, um, but it works a little bit different and we have more options to select things. So basically what this function does is say, PySplit, please use this um, generate walk trajectory function and use these parameters to do so, to generate all of the tdump files, so to say, that we've just created before in, in HighSplit. And what we need to do to do that is we need to have a base name here. So you need to put this in um, quotation marks. So it should, oh yeah. So if you open the file, it should have all of the information in there, but please make sure it actually looks exactly the way it looks in here. So having these gaps, for example, is really important. And also the colors look, should look exactly the same. If not, let me know. 
Um, yeah. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do, so I named this summer 2016. Um, you can just give it any random name you like. And then we need to let it know about three file locations. So the first file location is navigating to the working directory. And in this case, it needs to be the high split working directory. So, um, sorry, I just closed that one. Um, Okay, so in the high split um, folder, go to working and this file path here. So at least on Windows, you can just copy paste it now and um, paste it into here. Just make sure you leave the little R and the um, quotation marks. On Mac, I think this is a bit different. Um, I don't know, Elizabeth, if you're there. Um, if you maybe could share in the chat how it looks like for you, if you have this file path as well. Um, and yeah, okay. So the next thing we need to um, select is the storage directory. So this is basically telling um, HighSplit where to store our results. And we can just go ahead and create a new folder. Um, and just name it uh, by the date of today. Now we just copy paste the file directory um, and paste it in here. Okay, uh, so the last uh, direction it also needs to know is where we store the meteorological data. So um, basically, we need to copy and paste the link where we stored our GDAS data. So these here. OK. OK, so that is so much for just setting directories. Um, now we're actually going to feed some information into the model about what it's supposed to do. Um, so here. We're going to set the day, uh, the year, so 2016. We're going to select the month, which is um, 8 for August, and we're going to stay at midnight. Um, the only thing that you will notice here is that the day is missing, and we're going to come back to that in a minute. So, okay, after the date, we're going to select the locations, um, which in this case is the height first, so it's like 10 meters, 1,000 meters, uh, 1,500 meters, and the locations here. So we're going to go to the coordinates, uh, in Mexico again. And then we can set it backwards to 120. And this line of code here, so the month slice function, this is actually used to set the date. Um, so the advantage of this one here is that we can now run it um, over several days, for example. So the way this month slice function works is basically the default would be, sorry, 0 to 32. Um, and this would be 1. So this is the default because that would tell HighSplit to make a simulation for every day of the entire month of August. And that is usually quite helpful if you want to run um, the entire month. And also, like if you would like to run this over or for example, summer, you could just add the summer um, month. So that would be June, July, August. Over all of them, it would run for every single day for all of these three months. Um, and you can even go ahead and like add more years like this. And there's, as far as I know, not really a limitation. So you can run over as many years as you want and as many months as you want. Um, in this case, so the only limitation, I guess, is um, having the data. So you might have noticed that it took some time to download the data. So if you want to download, let's say 10 years of data, this is going to be huge. Um, so yeah, that might take some time to actually download the data and have them. So this is why in this example, we're just going to stick to August. So you don't have to download um, too many data files. And also you can store the data on an external hard drive if you want. That's no problem at all, um, just for information. Okay, so 
this line of code is also um, important because it's basically saying, um, because we're going back in time and if we're starting on the 1st of August, we would actually go back into the last week of July. And in that case, so for us, it's now irrelevant because we don't actually have that data. But if you store all of the data you have in your GDOS folder and you run or yeah, you loop through several months, it's really important to use this part of the function and say, okay, also please include all of the, um, the last week of July and the first week of September, um, just to make sure that you're not like cutting off the simulation somewhere. Um, yeah, just as an information. And today, because we don't actually have the data for July, we are not gonna start on the first, we're just gonna start on the fifth. We're also not gonna go all the way. Um, so just go from the fifth, of August to the 25th of August. And to save some time, we're only gonna do that for every third day of this month. Okay, so the final step is now to tell PySplit where to find the actual um, model. So if you installed it on a Windows, that should be the default setting. If not, you need to find out where your file is stored. Sorry, I closed it again. Um, So usually that's in the high split folder executives. And then, so just copy and paste this part of the link um, and then add this section here. That should be the file it, it has to use to actually use the model. Um, yep. Okay. So I don't know if there are any questions so far. Um, but if not, we can just go ahead and run this section. And what's going to happen now is that in our results folder, there should be the so-called like tdump files starting to pop up. So if we just highlight all of this, click F9 and run it, um, soon there should be, yeah, so there they're coming in. Sorry, I'm about to uh, interrupt. There is an inquiry in the chat. Uh, Anupam has asked to share the source location from where Vidas data can be downloaded. Yes, so there are two things. Um, I can actually show you why this is running. Um, so you used to be able to just download this via the high speed GUI. So if you go to menu and methodology, uh, you can go to this here and archive. And then you can just select GDAS and whatever day and month you're interested in and just get the data. The problem is, um, yeah, I think this is, um, so this stopped working. And I think this is because um, some of the, uh, so some, uh, some computers require an FTP client to actually download the data. Um, so yeah, this is something, yeah. So for example, like for me, it doesn't connect anymore. So it used to just work fine. And you were also able to just download it through your browser. That also doesn't work anymore because I think most browsers just don't support FTP anymore. So uh, yeah, you would have to install a FTP client, um, but later after the tutorial, I can put um, the link in, in the chat. And also um, you can find most of this information on the NOAA website, uh, which I've linked in here. Um, so they have like a separate section just for like all the type of data that can be used and that's come, uh, that can be used for high speed because there's a certain format that's required. And um, I think actually for PySpit, you need to have weekly data and they need to be in a certain um, way label so that the model can actually recognize them. So yeah, but there's more information also on the GitHub website um, to find out more about what kind of data requirement there is um, for this. Okay. So once the simulation finished, which I think should be now, um, we can create a group from all these trajectories. 
And this is done by using the make trajectory group function in PySplit. Um, so we can go ahead and copy paste or like update um, the, oops, sorry, the fire path. So basically going to our results folder and something that I really like about this. So you might have been wondering about why the name is so long. So in this case, this is asterisk here, it just means that um, we want to have use all of the files that are in here, no matter how they are named. But if you have like, for example, certain experiments that you all label differently, this is how you can call them now. Um, so for example, if you just want to have the summer month, you can just go ahead, put summer in, and it should only load the files that have the, the word summer in, in the name. You can also use the date or like the August um, or the label that we used or we gave it before. This is really helpful if you do several experiments and you just want to plot certain of them because depending on what you're doing, running this section here could take forever. So especially if you run over several years, it's just very slow. So you don't want to do this over and over again. But if you want to just have a look at the different trajectories, um, you can also use the name um, to call them. OK, so in this case, we just want to take all of them. So we go ahead and do that. Um, and then we want to plot them now as spatial data. So PySpit comes with an inbuilt um, map designer, which is really nice. So there are like several um, examples on the GitHub website how to use this map designer and what kind of pr parameters you can use in it. And here we're just going to go ahead and set the um, the location. So in, in the way or the format this works is the first number here is lower left uh, longitude, then it's lower left latitude, uh, upper right longitude and upper right latitude value. Um, so because we switched from Irvine to Mexico, we're just going to change the latitude. Um, and then we say there will be no extra uh, or additional um, markers for longitude and latitude on this map. So we're just going to put these to none um, and we can load this. And then we can go ahead, make the map and initialize the map. OK, um, yeah, so this basically this line of code produces the map that we are seeing now. Um, so don't worry actually about the resolution. Like I know it looks pretty um, bad <laughs> in the preview, but once you export it, it looks much better and it is like in high resolution. OK, so now that we were able to plot the empty map, we actually want to plot the data. And this is only trajectory, so we're not plotting um, like changes in any of the parameters over time. We're just going to look at the different trajectories um, depending on height. So we're going to color code them. So 10 meters is going to be blue, 1,000 is going to be orange, and 1,500 is going to be black. We can go ahead and run that too. Um, and these two functions now, so this is assigning um, the colors to the data, and this is plotting the data on the map. And we need to run all of this together. Um, so from here on, and there we go. This is the different trajectories um, labeled by color that we calculated in our GUI. And you see a lot of lot more of them uh, compared to just the high speed GUI. That's because we did them over several days in, in the month. Um, yeah, so, so far, um, I just want to ask if everyone is still uh, following and if there are any questions so far um, on how to use this or maybe some problems people ran into. OK, well, feel free to interrupt me um, at any time. So the next example we can look at is um, how to actually plot some of the data and how to access this. So most people are probably interested in uh, moisture flux or the moisture source. So the problems with the trajectories is usually that 
why they give you a rough estimate from where the air masses come from and where certain parcels traveled, it doesn't really give you that much information about whether or not this, this trajectory is sparing any moisture or if it rained out at your location. Okay, so for this, um, we also require two more packages so we can just import all of them. And we're gonna keep um, the name working directory that should all be the same. Um, the only thing, oh yeah, so yeah, I can actually say. It. So um, this is basically, we have done that already. So in this example, we're not gonna run it again. I've just included this here in case um, you might forget that this needs to be run beforehand. So just to have the entire uh, run complete. So what we can do at the moment is just go ahead and create the trajectory group again. Um, oh yeah, sorry. This is actually with the old path. Okay. And then um, PySplit comes with different functions already. So there's a function to calculate the moisture flux and we're just gonna loop through all the trajectories in our trajectory group calculate dis distance, vector, and moisture flux. And in any case, like if this now gives you an error message saying like, please calculate this beforehand, um, this usually happens if you just installed high split brand new and haven't used it. So if this is the case, you need to check whether you actually selected the output because sometimes it just creates like only the pressure file. So you wouldn't be able to actually access any information because the PySplit is basically just another interface to run um, the simulations here. So you need to use, or this is the reason why you actually need to have the GUI installed before you can use PySplit at all. Okay. So this time we are gonna use, um, so this is just saying, I want to have a figure with this specific size. Um, and we're gonna use a bit of a different um, projection for our map. So uh, I've put in a link here where you can look at the map function specifically. And this also explains what kind of options you have in terms of like spacing, um, for example, these labels here or the different type of projections you can use and different font sizes and so on. Um, so the rest should already look um, familiar. So just the map corners. And this time we're gonna set where we would like to have the labels um, and we are creating the map again. So yeah, okay. So if you run this section now, um, yeah. So it's just opening the figure for now because we haven't actually plotted the map yet. Um, so this is the next line of code. What we want to have again is just plotting the map. So we run this together, should hopefully, yeah. So there's our map. So it looks a little bit different now. Um, and actually I need to update the location. Yeah, there we go. Okay. So uh, now that we calculated the moisture flux, we can plot it. Um, and the way to do this is the easiest is like using the scatter um, plot function on a map. So here we're gonna say, okay, please loop through all of the trajectories. And we're gonna do that for just every third, just to save time. And then we're gonna plot this and we use the trajectory scatter function um, that is in PySplit. And the information that you need is the data um, and X and Y coordinates. Then you need to also tell it on what to plot it. So this is our map um, and what color to use. And also what you wanna do is include a color bar um, because you also want to see what you're plotting and what kind of units it's in. So this is just setting the position of the color bar on this figure. Um, then we are making the color bar uh, using different, like you can, for example, decide what you want to have the takes all the labels, um, font size, um, what you want to call this color bar and uh, like what you want to label it. Um, yeah, 
so if we just go ahead and run all of this, so line 23 to 44. Yeah, so there we go. So this is some of the trajectories we calculated now. And um, so this is skipping every uh, to every six. So if we want to have more of this, um, if we just, no, I think we put it like this. Um, yeah, that should give us Uh, yeah, so this is now including more trajectories, um, including the moisture flux along the trajectories. So this is like the first indication about what you can get, like where potential moisture sources might be, um, what happens with the moisture along one trajectory. So this is already a lot more informative than just having each, um, each trajectory in itself, which is saying, this is where the air comes from. So now we actually know, okay, this is where the moisture comes from, or at least where it changes over time. Okay, so I think we have some more time left. Um, yeah, okay, so um, that was step one. So now if we want to calculate where we took the moisture up, um, we can use the trajectory moisture uptake function. Um, and the parameters you set is precipitation evaporation and the interval. And these two, or actually all three of them, are the default settings. And they are based on a paper from Zodomanet also. If you want to have more information about why specifically these thresholds were used, um, I recommend you to check out this paper. So, okay, now we can just calculate that. And this is probably going to take some time. Uh, yeah. So while this is running, uh, I can take you through what we're doing now. So we're going to use the exact same map again. Uh, so just update the coordinates uh, or like of the map corners. Um, the rest is going to stay the same. Um, this time we just scatter um, the, uh, yeah, we just scatter our results um, across our map. Um, so this time it's X and Y coordinates and then we plot the data. Again, this is setting the color we're going to use. Um, the Zorda function usually tells you where to plot the data. So for example, sometimes you plot something and you think it's not there. That's because it's hidden underneath the color of your, um, for example, of your continents or something. So this just makes sure we're going to plot this on top of everything else. Um, yeah, OK. And then just at the end, again, a color bar. So if we just highlight and run all of this. Yeah, OK. Yeah, so here you can see this is not really pretty. So what you can do is, for example, normalize the data before plotting it. So you get like a better overview about where the moisture comes from. Um, but in this case, it really looks like most of the moisture comes from this section here. Um, there's a couple of other ways to make this figure more, well, prettier um, that you can check out. And um, there's lots of information in the links that I provided. Um, and I know it's a lot, but sometimes it's worth, especially if you want to publish this, um, to just go through some of the tutorials that are provided. Um, yeah. And I think um, that was it for me. And uh, yeah, let me know if this all worked or um, if you had any problems with the code um, or any questions. <laughs>